In this video, we're going to be looking at the concepts of objects and systems. Why are we going to be doing this? Because learning how to simplify systems into an object is a very powerful step in the problem solving process. Often it's the very first thing that we're going to have to do because working with a simple case is much easier and faster than working with a complicated case. However, we don't end there. Once we have simplified the system and we see how the group is going, we're going to have to expand it back, expand it back out into the full-blown system it originally was to find out actually what's happening on the interior of the system. Many people are very good at the first step, but not so much for the second step. And so it is a process that we're going to be working with uh, throughout the entire year. In this video, we're going to be defining the terms of objects and systems. We're going to identify which perspective, an object or a system perspective, is the most appropriate, appropriate for a given situation. And we're also going to learn at the, and understand the usefulness of each perspective of both an object and of a system. So we're going to first start with the concept of geometry, because geometry has one of the best examples of an object, which is the point. A point in geometry is described as a region in space that is just too small to exist. It has no interior because it doesn't even exist. It's just so incredibly small. And it's nothing more than simply a location. This location is often described as a coordinate. So if I was looking at an xy coordinate system, it would be my x value and my y value as a coordinate. If it was a three-dimensional system, then it would be x, y, z coordinate. But that's all it ever has been. A uh, point is just a location in space, and there's nothing to talk about a point that there's nothing to really talk about in regards to what happens inside a point or what's inside that point because there is no inside. It's just too basic and it's too small. So a point, if you think about it, is really a very useless and meaningless and pointless thing. However, if I have a series of points side by side, then they can form something. If I have a limited number of points, I can form a line segment. If I have an infinite number of points, I can form an entire line. Now, regardless of when dealing with an entire line or the line segment that I see here, I can actually build other things off of that line. For example, if I have a series of lines side by side, I can now start to form a geometric shape or a plane. And a plane is really nothing more than a system of lines that are side by side. And that means they're really nothing more than a system of points. So this meaningless, small thing that can't even exist, when in conjunction with other objects that are similar, so other points that are similar, they can form a construct that is very large and very meaningful to us. If I have two planes, I can have them intersect, and I can even then start use those to form three-dimensional objects. So all of our physical geometry that we understand is based off of this one simple concept of a point. Everything that we ever look at, any shape, any line, any curve, you know, nothing more than a system of individual objects, and these objects are known as points, and everything else is a system of that. And there is an interior to the box and to the plane and to every line or ray that we look at. Here we have a person that has a box that's falling on top of them, and this is where our physics perspective comes in. If I was seeing this box fall at me, I would not be sitting, I would not be standing there looking at the box, contemplating, hey, I wonder what's inside the box. You know, the box is actually a complex system of individual things that are inside interacting and, and they're moving towards me as a group. I would be seeing a box. This box is falling at me. I have a falling object that's going to hit me unless I physically move out of the way. And so I'm viewing this box much like a point. There is no interior that I'm concerned with. Yes, the box has one, but I don't care. I want to get out of the way before that box hits me. So as of right now, I just view that as an object rather than a system. So a point in space is really just a location that's too small to exist. It has absolutely no interior. It's the most simplistic of things in geometry that you can work with. In physics, an object is very similar. It's going to be an oversimplified 
thing. It's a concept that has no internal parts. There's no interactions on the inside because there's nothing there. And we are often going to use this to describe an entire group. So again, there's this box, and it could be a box of nails, a box of bricks, a box of wooden planks. It could be a box of whatever. I don't really care. I just see a box. I'm going to describe it as a box. If we take a look at a person, however, we can actually view a person in a variety of different ways. For example, if we'll just see the everyday person, say, ah, well, we have a person right here. And often when we say something like that, we're actually treating this person as an object. However, we recognize that the human body is actually a system. In fact, it's a system of many systems. We have a circulatory system. We have a skeletal system. We have a nervous system, just to mention a few. And all these systems, plus the others, all interact with each other to form the overall human structure. And should there be a problem with one of these systems, then we can have issues with the other systems as well. And even with these systems here, the parts that make up our skeletal system is actually a subset of the system. Because if you think about it, we have our bone, you say, well, the bone is um, just an object in the system, but the bone actually has parts to it. You have the exterior bone, and then you have the interior marrow. The bones are all made out of cells. The cells all have parts. And so everything that we have that is a system is often going to be composed of smaller systems. Just like the geometric point being too small to exist doesn't make any sense because it's an idea, the physical object doesn't make any sense. It's just an idea. Everything is going to really be a system. It's just how far down do you want to look at it before you turn around and say, we don't care anymore. It's just this thing. So when I take a look and I see this person and say, hey, describe this person to me, I'm not going to turn around and start talking about the skeletal structure or the circulatory stru uh, system or anything else like that, because I don't really care about that. I'm just going to describe what I'm seeing, so this person really is being more viewed as an object than anything else at this point. So objects are often used when we're looking at the group as a whole and we're not worrying about the interior. That's why we turn around and say it has none, because we don't care about what's going on on the interior. If I'm looking at how what's going on on the interior of something, I'm going to view that something as a system, which is either a group of smaller objects or smaller systems or a combination of objects and systems all interacting with each other. And I basically, again, it's all going to come down to, do I care about what's happening on the inside? If I care about something that's happening on the inside, I'm going to view that thing as a system because you do have an interior and I'm going to have to consider that. If I just don't care, about what's going on on the inside, I'm going to view that thing as an object, simply because it's an easier perspective. Uh, we can take a look at this from a teacher's perspective real, uh, real fast. If we take a look at a class, if a teacher is looking at, okay, what does the class know, or how did the class perform on this last test, and we see the class average is an 80, I'm viewing that group as an object because the class got an 80, the class seems to have a fair handle on the material. If I'm actually viewing the class as a system, then I'm not going to look at the class average. I'm going to look at the individual performances of each of the students, consider where they are sitting, how each one has done, what is their strength and weaknesses on each question that was being asked. And that is a very overwhelming task. So often we start with viewing the class as a whole. We go, okay, the class has a general handle of this. And then we then look at the individual students after that, viewing it as a system, because it's an easier perspective. Teachers who only look at the class and never look at the individual students always have gaps because students will fall through the cracks because I never recognized there was a student there. Likewise, students, uh, teachers who only view the class as a group of students and never simplifies it uh, as a whole have a very hard time analyzing data because it's so overwhelming in the beginning. So we have to have the ability to first simplify the group down into an object, see where that group is going, and then expand back out into the population as a system. And that's what we're going to be doing here. So if I'm interested in how the group is as a whole, 
and nothing about the internal conflicts or interactions, I'm going to view whatever that thing is as an object. But if I am going to worry about what's happening on the interior, the interactions that take place there, the individual aspects of what's going on, then I'm going to have to take a look as a system. So here we have a submarine, and we're being asked a very straightforward question, is a submarine an object or a system? And the truth of the matter is, this question is actually a very bad question. Because the submarine is, in fact, both an object and a system. It all comes down to, how do I want to view it? So we could, we could rephrase the question and say, should we view the submarine then as an object or as a system? And this is also a flawed question because I don't know how to answer it because I don't know what the circumstances are. What am I worried about in regards to the submarine? So if you were to ask me this question, my only answer would be another question to you saying, what's the context? Do I have to worry about the interior or not? So if I was going to live in the submarine, if I was going to have to build the submarine, uh, design improvements for the submarine, I'd be then viewing this as a system because the submarine has many complex parts all interacting with one another. And if one section of the submarine has a problem, it often will affect other aspects of the submarine as well. However, if I was in another submarine somewhere else and I was looking at my sonar screen and I was sort of blips on my sonar screen, I would probably view any other submarine out there as an object. And the reason for that is because basically right now I'm more concerned with where, are, where is that other submarine? How far away is it from me? Is it moving towards me? Is it moving away from me? How fast is it moving? So in terms of the interior of whatever the other submarine is, I don't care. I worry about the interior of my submarine. So I'd be viewing anything on my radar screen as an object. No more, no less. In fact, if you take, I'm sorry, sonar screen. In fact, if you take a look at the sonar screen, all you see are dots. They're not identified as anything else. And the truth is, I wouldn't care if the submarine was, in fact, a military-grade submarine or a recreational submarine. It's just an object to me. In fact, it could even be something like a shark or other large sea creature. It's just an object. I don't care what it's made out of right now. I just care about how far away is it from me, where is it, and is it moving towards me or not. If we compare the sonar screen to our XY axis, we see that they look very similar. And that's because objects are considered to be dots, because, or I should say points, because that's what a point is. A point is something that's so small that has no interior. These are locations around my submarine, and I don't care about what's on the inside of them right now. I just care about where they are. And if you've ever watched a, a naval movie, when they take a look at the sonar screen and they see something, they turn around and they say, we have an object, because they don't know what it is. And at this particular time, they really don't care. Then they'll start to try to identify it. But right now, the important thing is, um, where is it? Where, how is it moving? And then they'll start to try, to try to identify later on when that becomes more important. Sound waves. Here's something that can be viewed either as an object or a system. And again, if I'm looking, trying to decide which way I should view it, I have to look at what the context is going to be. For example, if I was interested in the speed of the sound wave, I'd probably view it as an object because my wave would start over here in some location it would travel out to some point up over here. Now I'd have some distance and it would happen in some time. And then I could turn around and say that my speed is distance over time. And if it traveled 100 meters in one second, I'd say it's 100 meters per second. Well, what's making up the sound wave? I don't really care. It's like when a police officer stops someone who was speeding for going 80 miles an hour in a school zone, and the person tries to justify their speed because, well, this is like a super fast Lamborghini car, and you can't drive a car this slow. Cop doesn't care. You're supposed to go no more than 20 miles an hour, 
And if you go beyond 20 miles in one hour, or at a rate that would allow you to go more than 20 miles in an hour, you're going to get a ticket. The car does not matter. And if you are on some sort of bicycle and you were going at 30 miles an hour, I know that's incredibly fast, you would get a ticket as well. And you could turn around and argue that I was, you know, um, on, a, on, a, on a bicycle. Doesn't matter. You were speeding. So something you have to be aware of. We are looking here at this as an object. So a car, a bicycle, a runner, anything is all the same thing to us. There is no difference right now. It's just a concept that's oversimplified with no interior and it's just this point that's moving from one location to another. Now if I was interested in the actual behavior of the sound waves that actually affects it, what has happening inside the air, then I would be taking a look at the waves as a system. It would be a system of air molecules that are moving in a particular pattern while the wave itself is moving and often in a different pattern. So here we have a little video of air molecules. The black dots are all air molecules and the red dots are highlighted air molecules. There's nothing special about them other than the fact that they are red. And we can see that we have these waves that are moving from the left side of the screen to the right side of the screen. And the waves are these lines that seem to be going up and down. Or I should say these up and down lines that are moving sideways. And so if you notice, these waves are all moving in one set direction, like so. However, if I'm looking at the air molecules themselves, the things that make up the wave, I see their behavior is very different. In fact, if I highlight just a small section, you can see on how these molecules are only moving forward and backward. There is no real clump. Sometimes they seem to clump together and sometimes they don't as they move to the right and to the left. And so the wave is actually a system in reality of these air molecules that are moving in a very different pattern than the waves that we see. Now, if I'm only worried about the frequency, how loud the wave is, how fast the wave is moving, I can view this as an object because I don't care about what's happening on with the molecules. However, if I am trying to understand why the sound waves behave the way that they do or how I can alter the sound wave in some manner, then I need to look at this as a system. Please notice that my wave also has various parts that we aren't talking, haven't talked about before. We have the particles that make up the wave. We have these regions where you have high compression, where they're all stuck together. Those are called compression regions. The compression regions keep moving to the right. And then I have these big open spaces, and those are called rare fractions. That's where I have low density. Please notice, I don't have to compare any of that when I'm looking at the wave originally. When we looked at the wave originally, we just saw these, which is much easier to work with than the video up on top. So a lot of times it's easier to work with an object point of view than a system point of view. But if I want to understand what's actually going on, I need to look at this as a system. Water waves are another example of this because waves are waves, but not all waves are the same. Here we have this water wave, and when we see this, we often view this as an object. I see this water wave. It's got a height. It's moving to the right. It's starting to have a curl. But the reality is it's not quite just an object. However, if I was surfing, for example, I would often view this as an object. And surfers, they do not swim out to where the waves are, wait for the wave to come by, and when the wave is underneath them, stand up and ride the wave. If you notice in this picture, the person is actually in front of the wave. What they do is they paddle out to where the waves are, they wait for the wave that they want to ride, and then they start swimming back to the shore. They want to be in front of the wave, and they want to be falling on the face of the wave. They're always traveling a little bit faster than the wave itself to stay in front of it. And that's because if the wave gets underneath them, the wave is going to simply lift them up and then place them back down. If you've ever seen boats out on the water or people who are just sitting on the surfboards, 
You notice the waves come up, they get lifted up, they go back down, and they don't move to the shore. A lot of people actually think waves will carry you to the shore, and waves don't. The waves and the current are two very different things. Now, the reason why the waves don't carry you to the shore is because the water molecules that make up the wave act very differently than the wave that we see. The water molecules all move up and down. They, the wave is actually a system of molecules that are moving in the up and down direction, while the wave that we see moves along the surface of the ocean to the shore. In this case, it's going to be to the right. Please notice with the sound waves, we had waves, the particles move to the right and to the left. That was the particle motion, while the wave itself as a whole moved to the right. Here, these waves move to the right, but the particles that make them up move up and down. This type of wave is called the transverse wave, and the particles always move perpendicular to the direction of the wave itself. And so, which perspective is the best perspective to use, object or system? Well, what are you trying to do? What are you interested in? And I'll be very honest, going back to this surfer here, if I was interested in just riding the wave, I'm going to be interested in this as an object. It, how big is it? How fast is it moving? Is it something I want to ride? And I want to stay on the face of that wave if I'm riding it. However, if I have the unfortunate event of wiping out, I would then start to consider this more as a system because surfers who fall into the water know that once you get into the water, you get pressed down very far because the water waves are actually, the water molecules, I should say, are actually pushing you down because that's how the water is actually moving once that wave gets past you. You're going to get pressed down into the water and they will actually lift you back up and then push you back down. It can be a very dangerous situation. Electricity is another example on where we're going to be able to define something as an object and as a system. This is a situation that most people have a very hard time viewing as a system because everything's going to be much smaller, too small for us to actually ever see and notice. We take a look at the circuit and I can see I have a battery, I have a switch, I have a light bulb, but nothing's really happening. And you go, well, you have to turn the switch on. So we're going to flip the switch real fast. And now that the switch is closed, electricity is going to flow through the circuit, and I can see that I'll have an electrical current that leaves the battery, flows through the switch, through the light bulb, and back through the battery. And because the light bulb has electricity going through it, the light bulb is now going to shine. And we can easily view all this as an object. I flip the switch, and the light works easy enough it doesn't work well check the switch check the light bulb change the battery and it's going to be fine it's a simple straight up object nothing to worry about but the reality is it is actually a system in fact since it has a battery which is a object and a switch that has an object and a light bulb that we can view as an object those three objects make it a system you only need two objects to make it a system we have three and that's why it's like oh We'll check the light. Maybe that part isn't working because if that's not working, it's affecting the other two. If the switch is not working, it doesn't matter if the light bulb's good or, or if the battery's good because they're not allowed to work with the bad switch. And the same thing with the battery. And so right now we have then a system. But then we also have the concept of electricity. And throughout the course, we're going to look at things such as voltage, current, resistance. And these are concepts that people really have a hard time with because we never really think about what they represent. Electrical current is the flow of the electrical charges. It's measured in amps, and it's going to be represented by an arrow, and um, it's just known as the flow of electricity. And it seems pretty simple. But is this flow of electricity an object or a system? And I'll be very honest, a lot of times when we turn around and say we've got an amps, an amperage of, let's say, three amps flowing through this wire, we really have objectified it. It's current that flows in one direction, has one magnitude, has so much strength, and it's easy to work with. However, that's not exactly true. 
If I take a look at a small region of the wire and I magnify out to where I can now see the individual atoms that make up the wire, which is right here, the yellow circles are the nuclei, the red dots are the electrons. And I can see right away here that if I am looking at the movement of charges, there's no path here for a straight line. All of these charges have to zigzag around each other. Also, some of these charges are going to run into atoms or the nucleus of atoms. So they're going to slow down while others might speed up. And so I have this huge mess, but I'm going to view this whole mess as a nice, simple current. In fact, something that's really bizarre is we'll take a look later on in the course how these electrons are actually moving in the opposite direction of the current itself. And they all move at different speeds and all at different paths. So what we're looking at here as a current is an overall average flow of something that we defined as charges, which acts very differently than the particles that make it up. So this perspective here, a system perspective of current, is a mess. It is hard to deal with. So we'll often pick the object perspective of current as a constant steady flow because it's easier to work with. In fact, uh, an easy analogy of this is if you've ever seen uh, a herd of cattle. If you are from a distance, i got to be honest, it looks like the cowboy life is the easy life out there. You know, you have this whole herd of cattle. They all move in a straight line. You sit on a horse all day, and then you eat barbecue all night, and how easy is that? But if you ever get up close to a herd as they're going through a cattle trail it is, or a cattle drive, it is nothing that is easy. It is complete and total mayhem. Cows have a tendency, and uh, cows and steers, I should say, have a tendency to go where they want to go if they decide to move at all. And while you might be having the herd try and go to the left, if a cow decides it wants to go right, it's going to go to the right, and then you have to try and tell it back. And so there's a reason why cattle drives don't go very large distances very quickly. And that's because it, the actual movement of the cattle is analogous to these electrons over here while what we see from the distance is the nice, smooth, moving herd that doesn't exist at all. And that's the object point of view. So again, in a quick nutshell, objects in physics are going to be oversimplified concepts that we're going to use. There are going to be no internal parts, no interactions. We're just taking anything and we're just describing it as a group. And the group goes as a whole. If we deal with sports, for example, we often view teams as a object. The team has a winning season. The team has a losing season. It was a great season. It was a poor season. Well, it's entirely possible that you could have the worst season as a team, but an individual player has done the best they've ever done. It's even possible to have a member of the team break world records in performance, but yet still be on a losing team. So, Often when we are describing teams as a group or any population as just a group with one mindset, one objective, that's an object. Systems are always going to be a group of objects or other systems that interact. When we start talking about how people affect one another, we're now looking at that population as a system and not as an object. So a lot of times we're going to be starting our cases off with a system that we're going to have to simplify into an object to get the ball rolling. And then once we start to pull information out about that object, we will have to then expand it back out to the system to see really what's going on internally with the uh, system that we're looking at. Our next movie will be about the concepts of internal and external forces, but that'll be something that we're gonna look at just a little bit later on. Right now, there's gonna be a few questions on Canvas I'd like you to try out. This is just for me to see where you are at. Do your best, but do not worry about getting the questions right or wrong. If you get them right, that's awesome. I know that you know that stuff, and we can move on. If you are getting stuff incorrect, that's awesome. I now know what you have questions about, and we can focus on those when we meet in class.